everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We join you today from the Whistle Stop and Festival that's part of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service historic 100th anniversary celebration. We'll have much more from here a little bit later in the show. But first, we're talking about Oklahoma's wheat crop. We begin with our Extension Small Green Specialist, Jeff Edwards. The morning of April 15th, temperatures across the state of Oklahoma dipped well below freezing. Almost everywhere in the state we dropped below 32 degrees and in many of the wheat producing areas of the state we spent several hours below 28 degrees and in a few areas we even dropped below 24 degrees which was really bad news for our wheat crop. Even though we're about a week and a half behind where we would normally be this time of year, we were adv advanced far enough that those low temperatures will most likely result in some degree of damage to our wheat crop. This freeze is one more insult to already injured wheat stands. We were already in pretty rough shape in terms of wheat production in the state of Oklahoma. Southwestern Oklahoma and western Oklahoma, a lot of that crop has already been written off due to drought. And we're really pretty much too far along to be able to save that crop at this stage of the game. As we move into central Oklahoma, we still have some yield potential there. It's been reduced because of the drought. Plants are starting to turn blue. They're turning out, running out of water. But if we still receive some moisture here in mid-April, we can still uh, produce an average crop in central Oklahoma. Not only is wheat turning blue, in some areas there are reports of yellowing wheat. Uh, one reason that we've seen pop up in central Oklahoma is wheat streak mosaic virus. And this was an issue that was uh, caused last fall. It's a virus that is transmitted to wheat via the wheat curl mite. And we've had this issue in western Oklahoma for several years, but only in the past couple of years has it really crept into central Oklahoma. Unfortunately, if wheat is suffering from wheat streak mosaic virus, there are really no curative treatments. The key there is keep that in mind next fall and be sure that uh, any volunteer wheat, corn, or grasses are killed and dead two weeks prior to planting because the wheat curl mite cannot survive more than two weeks without a green host. If you suspect that you might have wheat streak mosaic virus in your field, the best thing to do is send in a plant sample to the plant diagnostic lab. Other things that could be showing up this time of year are wheat soil borne mosaic virus and wheat spindle streak mosaic virus. Again, we would send in a sample to the plant diagnostic lab. And if you have either one of these issues, the key there is to plant a resistant variety next fall. And as we move further into spring, insects are appearing in our crops as well. A couple of other issues that have been showing up around Oklahoma are the brown wheat mite and the winter grain mite. And what you're going to look for is kind of a silverish or bronzing appearance on the wheat, and it just doesn't seem to be growing, even though there's moisture there. Uh, you have to go out and scout for those insects. They're kind of hard to see, but if you look closely enough, you can find them on, on the plants. And generally, we say that you should spray if there's obvious injury out there and there are several mites present. Edwards details the challenges Oklahoma wheat producers face in his new blog post. We have a link on our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Joining us now is Brian Arnell, our Extension Nutrient Management Specialist. And Brian, not all yellow wheat that we're seeing is, is because of disease problems. No, there's definitely some wheat out there that has some nitrogen deficiencies. As we go across the state, as I drive, I'm seeing spots develop up where, where the wheat's had some moisture and are starting to grow, and we are, we are seeing nitrogen deficiencies. Uh, a lot of that time it can be identified uh, 
either through the the geographic area of it or topography maybe it's on the top of a ridge where the nitrogen might have moved down with moisture or in an area area that is low line has had water standing on it for a while on the backside of terraces nitrogen deficiency is fairly easy uh, to separate from disease and insect pressure in that the wheat is a overall yellowing appearance it's just not growing quite as well it's a little bit shorter it's stunted and it has a yellow appearance uh, also the lower older leaves are going to be more yellow than the top so the symptomology progresses from the oldest leaf to the newest leaf and it's a general yellowing overall uh, the plant if you look at these two plants we have the deficient on the left and the good wheat on the right and so in the good wheat you can see that it's green from the top to the bottom there's no yellowing occurring but if we bring in this nutrient deficient or the nitrogen deficient wheat you see that the oldest lower leaves have a much more yellow appearance and you have a general yellow appearance that goes throughout the entire plant but it is much worse at the bottom if you go to the very top leaf in this case you see that it's this uh, top leaf right here it's actually fairly green looking it's not quite as yellow as the rest so remember nitrogen starts at the oldest leaf and works its way up to the newest leaf now what are some other potential problems that we could be seeing in wheat this time of year one of the things that you could be looking for, a little too late to do anything about, but you can identify for next year, would be our other primary nutrients, phosphorus and potassium. So phosphorus, what you'd be looking for is that purpling, uh, a dark purpling, and again, on the lower part of the leaves. Phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium, and magnesium all develop on the oldest leaf first, and then newer leaves later. All of our other nutrients develop at the top of the plant and work its way down. So phosphorus is a purple color, the lower part of the plant. Potassium, a little bit more challenging to separate out from nitrogen because it is a yellowing on the older leaves. And it's a general yellowing on the older leaves. What you have to look for potassium would be indications of where you're growing in. It would show up in a sandy soil, a deep soil. Um, we don't have many potassium deficiencies in Oklahoma, but we could have some. So look at the plant and look at the soils. And of course, uh, by all means, take a soil sample to confirm. And in terms of management, once you get your samples and you get some sort of confirmation, yeah. what can we do at this stage? At this stage for the wheat crop, the closer we get to flag leaf for nitrogen, the further away we get from making any improvements. We're currently doing some work right now uh, on how late can we apply nitrogen and how much recovery before flag leaf. So we're actually going to put out nitrogen this week and next week on nitrogen efficient wheat. What we've seen in the past is that we have about a 50-50 chance of getting yield back when it's this late. We're past hollow stem, but we aren't quite to flag leaf yet. You know, in some cases we get a good response. Uh, we never make maximum yield, but we, we gain yield back. In some cases we don't. I think when we look back on it after a couple years of looking at this problem, humidity, temperature, soil moisture, rainfall will play a big factor. I would say if you have wheat out there right now with cowpox, with signs of nitrogen deficiency, if there's an opportunity to get on it a week or two before flag leaf, make a consideration of putting some, some nitrogen on the crop. We do have to worry about burn if we're using UAN we're investigating using water to, to cut UAN and see if we can push the rates that way. And be mindful of that all-important yield. Being mindful of that all-important yield. Let's try to get yield as much as we can. I'd really like to hope that before this point, if you'd seen the cowpox prior to, we'd had the nitrogen out there, but I know how time gets in the way. It sure does. And you have more information on your blog and online, and producers can reference that and read a little more at their leisure. Absolutely. Okay. Brian Arnell, our Extension Nutrient Management Specialist. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. 
Tuesday morning was a cold shock across Oklahoma. That morning, April 15th, only three mesonet sites came in with lows above freezing. Medicine Park, Fairview, and Tulsa. The coldest site in the state was Chickasha at 21 degrees. 44 mesonet sites fell to 25 degrees or colder, while 70 mesonet sites came in at 27 degrees or colder. An overnight low of 27 or lower is considered a hard freeze rather than a frost. The hours below freezing were significant. 101 mesonet sites experienced four or more hours below freezing. 16 sites were below freezing for 10 or more hours. It will take some time to see how much damage there was to crop and landscape plants in the colder areas. A map of rainfall from January 1st to April 15th shows how little rain Oklahoma has received so far this calendar year. The red areas have had less than 20% of their normal rainfall. The bright orange areas have seen 40% or less. Areas colored dull orange have had 60% or less. The yellow areas 80% or less. With all of the wind and low rainfall, we are seeing a good number of days with high fire danger as measured by the Mesonet OK Fire Burning Index. The spot in the state with the highest index values this spring has been Medicine Park in Comanche County. Over the 30 days from mid-March through April 15th, 18 days have had a peak burning index of 80 or more. Eight days have been at 100 or more. The highest day hit 128 on the burning index scale. That was last Sunday, April 13th. The burning index value provides an estimate of flame height. Dividing the burning index value by 10 is what firefighters can expect the flame height to be at the head of the fire. Four counties had active burn bans as of April 15th, Cimarron, Alfalfa, Roger Mills, and Custer. These four county burn bans are scheduled to expire on April 28th. Soils have been warming. An April 16th map of the three-day average soil temperature at four inches under bare soil indicated soils in the southwest have warmed into the mid-60s. For the coolest soils in the northeast, soils are in the mid-50s. We continue to look forward to some wetter, more widespread rain events. Maybe you'll be one of those fortunate enough to get a good rain before our next report. Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. We've heard from the wheat guys and we've heard from the weather guys about this last week and, and how it could affect the wheat crop. Well, Kim, let's talk about how that could affect the markets. Well, the markets are volatile, as we've talked about. Uh, you look at the July contract of which the old crop bids off of and the new crop bid. February the 3rd, we had $6 on that uh, July contract. By uh, March the 20th, it was up to a $7.94 and a half. On April 11th, it was back down to $7.23. And then, of course, this week it uh, peaked out again at uh, $7.80. And so you just got a lot of volatility from the drought, the freeze, and what's going on in the Ukraine. Okay, well, as far as the drought and the freeze goes, in years past, that's produced a different quality of wheat uh, when, when it goes to the bins. Let's talk about that and how it could affect the price. Well, you know, this, this last year's uh, crop, we had uh, lower yields, but we had real good protein. The protein in the other parts of, of the world, competing exporters were below average, so we had excellent demand. And that's one reason that uh, hard red winter wheat prices are up in that $7 range. If we have good protein this year, it's going to assure us export demand. The excess or high export demand will depend on what the protein is around the rest of the world, but protein never hurts. Okay, like you said, there's been a lot of volatility in the markets. Let's talk about what's been happening with that. Well, if, uh, if you look at the, the volatile prices and the, the risk in the, the field with the producers, you know, it's, it's very difficult to forward contract because producers just don't know how much wheat they're going to produce. 
Plus, if they forward contracts, you know, like we talked about, producers forward contracting on February the 3rd and a dollar and 82 cents later, you know, in five weeks, uh, they would have left that on the table. So there's just a lot of risk and uncertainty in both the markets and in production this year with wheat production. Okay, nationally, there's a lot of concern about corn prices right now. Let's talk about that. Well, there's some uh, volatility in corn. Their prices are on the board. The December contract's up near $5. Uh, Right now, corn plantings are a little below average, but they just they just started. They can catch up real fast. But the the corn market's watching the, what's going in the ground. Any stocks are what 700 million less than what they project projected uh, earlier in the year. So uh, there's volatility in corn, but not as much risk in corn as there is in wheat. Okay. The big question: Should Oklahoma producers be taking advantage of this of this price right now? Well, given the drought situation, I don't think so because they just don't know how much they're going to produce. If they've got crop insurance for the wheat, and if they get crop insurance for the corn, then they can probably do it. Well, thank you as always, Kim Anderson, grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. As we're wrapping up this spring calving season, this is an excellent time to look over the, the cow herd. Since they're at the peak of lactation, we can identify which cows might have some problems, have some unsound udders that we'd want to mark down in our herd book so that we can cull those cows next fall. I think a lot of ranchers would be surprised if they knew the percentage of beef cows that carry the organisms for mastitis. And, and that, of course, is the situation that dairymen are all too familiar with, where there's an infection in one or more quarters. In beef cows, of course, those go untreated, and the quarters may become dry quarters. Uh, research tells us that uh, if a cow has one or more dry quarter, that the weaning weights of the calves may be down as much as 50 to 60 pounds, which in today's calf market is really substantial. If we uh, take time to uh, look at the cows closely, perhaps as they would run through a, a chute, we might actually want to feel and see if there are some quarters that uh, feel very hard to us or uh, feverish. That'd be an indication that there would be an infection in that particular area and uh, would reduce the milk production of that cow. The other things that we would look for are those situations where the udder of the cow, perhaps due to age, is breaking down over time. We may have a loosening or weakening of the suspensatory ligament that holds up the udder, or in addition, some of the very large cone-shaped uh, teats that make it difficult for that baby calf when it's first born to locate that teat, get his mouth around it, and start to nurse. We know that all of that can affect the uh, early calf health because it will slow that calf's ability to get the colostrum that it needs in a very short period of time. So we would like to get those cows culled out of our herd and not receive replacement heifers from them because there is a genetic component to utter soundness. I think we can, over time, make some real improvements in utter soundness in any beef cow herd by watching for these particular problems, select against them, and then as time goes on, we'll have a, a herd with more sound udders, less problems, and heavier calves at weaning time. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. Joining us once again, Daryl Peel, our Livestock Marketing Specialist. Daryl, last time you were here, we were talking about prices. They were just up, up, and up, and, and just kind of seemed to keep going that way. Anything changed in the last two weeks? Well, you know, I think we are probably near a top in most of these cattle and, and uh, the wholesale beef markets. Uh, you know, and, and that's to be expected <clears throat> seasonally um, and, you know, just in general. They can't keep going up, obviously, but there's a number of factors going on. Wholesale beef has, uh, has peaked and come back down from its second really roller coaster high this year. Uh, that obviously is squeezing the packer side. Fed cattle prices have not actually come down that much yet, but they look like they have probably topped out. I do expect them to begin working their way lower here through the second half of April and certainly into May and June when we get into the seasonal peaks in fed cattle marketings and cattle slaughter. All right, now here we are, it's mid-April. We've had temperatures this week around 90 degrees and, and now we've had snow. 
How has that played into things? Well, I think the weather is, is having a big impact on, on feeder cattle markets and cow markets in particular. The cold weather is probably the major factor right now. It's been a cold spring most everywhere. And so even in places that have moisture, we've seen very delayed uh, forage development on the one hand. Pastures are not ready. And so that's an issue. Um, in, in, the, in the case of crop production, the cold weather is delaying planting. We're just, you know, really getting into that, but certainly the corn market is going to start watching that very carefully, adding volatility to, uh, you know, as, as markets go up or as weather goes up and down. And so that will be an impact uh, potentially on the feeder cattle market as well. All right, now you mentioned moisture, but even though we've had a little this week, it's still not much. We've still got some pretty drought conditions throughout the state. How's that playing out? You know, uh, we have an awful lot of the state that's in marginal drought conditions, some that are in serious drought conditions. And as the clock ticks here, we're, we're in mid-April, we've got maybe another month left really to get these forage uh, conditions improved. Again, we talked about temperature, but obviously uh, once it warms up, if we don't have moisture, then we're going to be in a, a serious situation. So those producers, you know, from the standpoint of feeder cattle markets, I think we are beginning to see some, again, some signs that it's topped. It really hasn't come down very much yet, but it looks like it's kind of topped. These cull cow markets uh, actually came back down a little bit. Uh, they've peaked at a you know very high record level this spring, but they've come back down a little bit this spring. And, and again, we could be back into some uh, increased uh, beef cow culling here in the next month if we don't see some improvement in forage conditions. All right, plenty to keep an eye on. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State. Another consideration that we have for burning is slip-on pump units. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of pump units that you can, you can use, you can design, you can build yourself, you can go out and buy. Uh, there's also a lot of different types of pumps and everything else that you can do. So one of the things you need to consider when you're thinking about either purchasing or building a slip-on pump unit is what kind of vehicle you're going to put it into. That's going to be one of the first things. The next thing on that vehicle you need to figure out is what is the load capacity? What is that vehicle rated for? Most slip-on pump units for vehicles are rated at usually anywhere from about 300 gallons on down. This one here for this utility vehicle here, we have a 55-gallon tank with it. The next thing to think about is what type of pump that you may want to have with it. There's several different kinds of pumps that are out there that you can use. You know, there's piston pumps, diaphragm, centrifugal, roller type pumps. In prescribed burning, I found that under most circumstances, these low volume, high pressure pumps are the way to go because one thing it does is helps conserve your water. Also to think about is again, your hose. You know, how much hose do you need? Do you want a hose reel? Do you want an electric hose reel, a manual hose reel? Also is, is the nozzle, you know, the type of gun or type of nozzle that you're going to spray with, what is it able to, to do? Just remember to put all these things in consideration wherever you're thinking about buying or putting together some type of slip-on pump unit, either for a small utility type vehicle all the way up to even your full-size, you know, three-quarter, one-ton pickup. Now back to the Whistle Stop and Festival. In the early days of extension, agriculture agents traveled by train in order to get important information out to producers and farm families. A day of nostalgia for the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service, perhaps even the whole state, when one really considers 100 years of serving farmers, families, and entire communities. To mark the occasion, Extension went back to its roots on the railroad. Extension always has to use the technology that's available. And back in those days, the quickest way to get around the state and to carry some of the equipment and demonstrations that we had was to use a train and the train companies cooperated with that because agriculture is one of their big customers and so they allowed free passage on the trains. Extension agents would ride those trains in the early 1900s and when they would arrive at times hundreds of people would be on hand to get the latest information from the USDA and from what was then Oklahoma A&M College often called a county fair on wheels. 
It was a big deal. In fact, they say uh, lots of times they shut down the courthouse and the school and the post office and everything and uh, just shut the town down for a couple of hours and everybody went down to the depot where the train came in and stood around and waited for, for the program that the extension folks were delivering. So when the train rolled into the rock and rail yard at Wellston recently... This laboratory on wheels contains all the latest and greatest in early 20th century family living and farming techniques. That's what today's extension educators from across Oklahoma recreated in a native pecan grove. Educational lessons for everyone, from livestock and crops to gardening and insects, home and family to 4-H and much more. The vintage mixed in with the most modern day all to show the impact and reach of extension through the years and also what lies ahead. What we're wanting to do here is just help, really help kids understand how technology is going to be driving a lot of our careers in the future, especially in natural resources. And did someone say food? A ch molten lava chocolate cake and uh, deluxe potatoes with a crispy topping that are like twice baked potatoes that are just yummy. Dutch oven cooking just like the early days. They last forever. They're seasoned like Teflon if you take care of them. And they hold the heat a long time. And Martha Washington even will, mentioned them in her will and specified who hers went to. So they've been uh, valued by people who cook in the outdoors particularly for a long time. It's really a revitalization of people liking to learn this skill. And we're teaching a lot of kids to do this now with the outdoor 4-H projects. Speaking of the younger set, they're especially fascinated with the older ways. 12-year-old Hannah Thompson sums it up best. I'm going to tell my friends that I really had a fun day. It was really awesome. Just looking back at the past and seeing from the old days and seeing to the future that I might teach my grandkids. And if the past century is an indicator, Cooperative Extension will be right there with Hannah and her friends, teaching, extending knowledge, and changing lives well into the future. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu. You can also follow us on YouTube and other social media. From the historic Whistle Stop and Festival celebrating 100 years of Cooperative Extension, I'm Lyndall Stout, and we'll see you next time at SUNUP.